than anybody. Your life is, is obviously one that doesn't involve a lot of passive behavior. You know, you're, you're, you work very hard. You're constantly uh, in motion. The transition between that and the way you are now has got to be very difficult. And so um, I would, I'm interested in, in how that affected you because it was more than just your body giving up. You had to change everything mm -hmm. about you inside as your outside changed as well. And how is it for you guys to sort of see that change and see Dean as your friend and then adapt to that change? And is it, I mean, uh, that's sort of what I'm mm -hmm. going It's that contrast mm -hmm. in such a short amount of time mm -hmm. that I think is, it's got to be very difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> when he watches <laughs> so basically I think we were looking and having you describe for us how you were before and then obviously mm. now I mean that and yeah um <laughs> the frustration um uh, what? <laughs> Professionally. Um. Seeing um, a good news story, yeah. And wanting to be there, yeah. Adrenaline. Uh, the adrenaline rush after getting that story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he does. Dean will um, watch the news and talk about uh, ways that he would have covered it, mm -hmm. and or see something happening, and he'll know exactly who he would need to go talk to. <laughs> so I think, um, I, and that hasn't gone away at all. That's still very much there. He's still very much a news writer, and still very much thinks about, you know things from a journalist's perspective, so that doesn't go away. <laughs> mm -hmm. Especially as a broadcaster. I mm -hmm. mean, that's the, where your training and where your background was. It need, probably is additionally frustrating. Losing your ability to communicate. Um, it's probably worse than walking or... I'd rather be able to talk than walk. Kimmy, yeah. let's talk to you. Um, tell me some Dean stories. Talk to oh. me. You've been around a long time. Started when you were eight. Yeah. Um, tell me about. Tell me some Dean stories, and then and then what I all all want you to, as you tell me stories, uh, Dean stories, then sort of follow up with how it's been mm -hmm. through the the courts and the progression of, of his disease. Dean and I go way back. I remember when he first started. And what was so impressive about Dean, and what was so exciting about Dean, was he was so excited about the news. I mean, he was such a go-getter. And we get up at 3.15 in the morning, and we're at the office at 4 a.m. It's an ungodly hour, and Dean had an ungodly energy to do the news at that hour. <laughs> he was always really excited and very anxious to go out and start his day and get the news. And just as he still has that kind of energy and watches the news and hears the news and, and still gets really excited about stories and wants to be out of those stories, he, he did at that time. I mean, he just would go out and get the story and then he'd call up and say, yeah, I got the interview, I got this and I've got that. And that's what really impressed me about Dean was that he really, really liked what he did. And he'd, he'd been around a while. <laughs> 
and he still he wasn't tired of it. He wasn't tired of the job. He wasn't tired of the stories. He wasn't tired of anything about that had anything to do with news. He really was just excited to be in Sacramento and excited to get the stories in Sacramento. And he really made an impression on a lot of people um, in the newsroom and outside the newsroom. People he would interview. They still come up and ask me, "Hey, how's Dean going?" and What's he up to? And I mean, just people that you you see on the street that you interview, ask about him. And in the newsroom, I mean, he was kind of an inspiration, I think, to all of us to maybe work a little bit harder and get a little more excited. It's really easy at four o'clock in the morning just to be cranky and tired, <laughs> and not want to do anything. And Dean was very inspi inspiring that way. You guys all know Dean. You're well aware in the news business. We, we we're very busy. We do a lot of stuff, but we rarely take the time to acknowledge each other or to mm. to to go to that lunch that you always think you can go to with a coworker, and we have to go get a beer, but you never seem to do it. It always seems to be time for it. And then talk to me about how you, when you realized that Dean was sick and how that affected you and were you suddenly say, oh my gosh, this is one of us. Well, how can this happen to us? We're supposed to be immune from this type mm -hmm. of stuff, you know? When I found out Dean was sick, well, I guess I should back up. We, we all kind of knew there was something wrong. I remember one case in, in particular, Dean was actually live on the air doing a story. And he, he couldn't seem to catch his breath and he couldn't seem to swallow. And our anchor at the time said, do we need to take a break on the air? And I was just glued to the radio and I was listening and, and Dean said, yeah, that, that would be good. And I think at that point I really realized there was something wrong. But even then, I, I don't think I realized how serious it might be. You know, Dean was 35, and you think, oh, he's got mono, or maybe he has, you know, Epstein Barr, or something like that. Where you didn't complain he was tired all the time. So you think it's going to be something that, that, that is devastating, but certainly not something that could be deadly in, in the long run. You think, oh, it's just something like mono. And I was in, I was in the studio, and I was on the air. And I looked out this window that we have that looks onto the newsroom, and I saw a coworker of mine crying. And I thought, well, what the, what the heck is that all about? So I went out there at a break, and I said, what's going on? And she said, well, I just heard about Dean. And I said, well, what do you mean you just heard about Dean? I didn't know anything about it. And she said, well, he was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease. And it was like all of a sudden there was just this pressure and this big anxious feeling. And I, I just remember thinking, well, what does this mean? Or what, is, what, is this, what does that mean? Yeah, because I really didn't know anything about it. So it was a Friday. So I said, okay, he's got Lou Gehrig's disease. So I went home, and I spent two hours looking up everything on the Internet. I could have uh. Lou Gehrig's disease, which I don't recommend because it's really scary because I spent the next two hours crying after that. I mean, mm -hmm. it was really not fun. I mean, it was really, I think, scary because it really was so, someone like Dean, who was so vibrant and so active and energetic to do the news, at 4 o'clock in the morning, active and energetic to do the news, and then to, to, to read and to hear about this disease that could rob him of that was really a wake-up call to me because if someone that energetic and that vibrant and this could happen to them, it's very scary for you because it's almost like a, a sense, a reality check. It's a sense of your own mortality. But if someone with that kind of energy, something like this could happen to them, you think, oh my gosh, you know, it's just, it's a bad feeling. So let me ask you and, and everybody, and, and let's talk about that, because I wonder, I've talked to a lot of ALS patients over the year, and if there's one theme I think that I see time and time again, it's very similar to Dean's story. Young, and, and I don't know whether, I, I think, what is the breakdown of male versus females? Predominantly male. Yeah, it's predominantly male. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and so I, and I probably, that's why I'm a little skewed, mm -hmm. but I, I'll be careful, but from the men that I've interviewed, um, the story is very similar. They were, you know, you're talking about robust, healthy young men who are literally at the peak of their life, both professionally and personally. And um, it, it seems again and again um, um, that that it, it's almost, you know, e more devastating because of that, and, and makes it more tragic. Had did, did was there a sense of that? Did it remind? people in the newsroom that, wow, what, how does, because I think it's natural and normal, well, what does this mean about me? Mm -hmm. and, and if you felt that, did you feel badly for thinking about that? And how did all that reconcile with, with Dean getting sick? Well, for me, I think when Dean got sick, it just, it just 
you know, really opened my eyes because I'm thinking to myself, he was only, you know, he's only a few years older than I am, and we're working the same shift, we're, we're dealing with a lot of the same things, a lot of the same situations with our health and with our lifestyle, and it's just like, wow, I mean, you just really kind of step back and go, okay, what adjustment do I have to make? And then uh, I started, I started catching a little cold, and I, I started worrying, okay, is this, is this, am I going to start going down the same path as Dean? And yeah, it, it tears you up inside because you, you're, you're feeling bad for, for thinking that way, and you know, I, I know, I know for myself, it just, it, it really, it really tore me up inside, and you know, prayed a lot for him, and, and prayed a lot for me just to kind of get some guidance, and you know, how do you, how do you approach, you know, such a situation, things like that. Mm-hmm. Jeff, in the in the media, and I, I alluded to it a little bit, we, we're, we're so, in our own way, arrogant um, because we feel like we only tell other people's bad stories, mm-hmm. right? We don't have any bad stories of our own, right? So this is sort of a wake-up call, a slap in the face that nobody is, is truly insulated. Talk to me a little bit about when you first spoke with Dean as his disease was progressing and how it is now to come over to his house, spend time with him, and... and Again, we're looking at that contrast between when before and after in a relatively short amount of time. I, I can say unequivocally that the first conversation I ever had with Dean about his ALS is still the most inspiring, powerful conversation I've ever had with anybody about anything. I remember first hearing uh, through the grapevine, if you will. In fact, I, I think Cammy filled me in, as I recall. Um, as to what she had learned, and she mentioned that she had gone on the internet and learned a little bit about ALS. And uh, I was briefed on what was going on with Dean. And I remember thinking to myself, quite selfishly, how to have that first conversation. What, what do you say to somebody who's been diagnosed with ALS? What is the proper thing to say? Mm-hmm. And I remember walking out to the newsroom to try to start that conversation two or three times and chickening out and turning around and okay, I have to have this conversation. And the first thing Dean did was make me feel very comfortable and and let me know that this was a conversation he wanted to have and that there, without saying this, that there was nothing that I could say that would be wrong in this conversation. And I remember how powerful that felt. And then, and this is so, so Dean, he turned the whole thing around into this incredibly positive thing that this was this great opportunity that he has been given to help a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And that is what I remember. It just, it blew me away how somebody who had just heard the news that he had heard could be so positive and could turn this into such an opportunity, as he phrased it, as I recall, to do something really, really good. And uh, here we are, two and a half years later, Dean in front of a camera sharing his story and I know this is going to do a lot, a lot of good. How long has it been since you folks all got together? Long time, short amount of time? Mm-hmm. It's, I don't know, I think we saw each other probably... It was kind of right before you got married, I Yeah, think. right yeah. before, you know, sometime in, in 2000. Right. But it's probably been since then. Share with me, Cammie, how you felt this afternoon when you walked in and you saw Dean. And, and I felt really good. <laughs> I, I really, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know how he would look, how he would be acting, what the situation would be. And I felt incredibly positive coming in. I felt that he looked good, um, that he still had some abilities. Because, I mean, really, I, I, I didn't know what to expect. And I, I'm really happy with how, how, he, how he is and how he's feeling and how he's communicating. I mean, he's, he, you know, you mentioned that losing the ability to communicate is very frustrating. But I, I can sit here and have a conversation with him, and it's, it's the same old Dean. Mm. You know, Jeff was mentioning that, you know, <laughs> he mentioned that, you know, there's anyone that, that could turn this around and make it really positive. It's Dean, and that's absolutely true. Because all he did was transfer all that vigor and energy of doing the news into making people aware of ALS. And if there's anyone that can make a lasting impression, on the need for ALS awareness, it's Dean and Catherine Adractus. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, I, I mean, even I think after death, <laughs> there's going to be an impression in it. It's just the way it should be. Chris, what do you care? 